sweet truth. That means there's some good and bad and everything else in there. So let's just dive right into it. So the sugar consumption has really gone crazy. So where did sugar come from? It came all the way from Borneo, Papua New Guinea. And that was around the 12th century. And slowly, slowly, it made its way over to India. And in India, right around 1400 or so, somebody decided that, hey, we can make this molasses into crystals. And the crystals will last forever. And then when, of course, um, Alexander the Great and all the other people came, they saw the crystals, they took them back to Europe. And they could transport them. And that's how the Europeans got sugar. And then they got addicted to it. And then they went out and found the new lands. And in those new lands, new discovered lands, that's what started all the trade and all the um, plantations, et cetera, et cetera. And you know the rest of the history. But basically, sugar's only been around for a very, very short time in our history, in our genetics. We really have not had exposure. If we look at our entire 100 years, let's say, of existence, sugar has just come in in the last millisecond. So our body has not been able to adapt to sugar. And if you look at the growth of the industry, it's phenomenal. And then, of course, came World War II, and at that time, the sugar levels went down. And then high fructose corn syrup came onto the scene in the 80s. And that, of course, added even further impetus to the sweetness on our sweet tooth. And then there you go, sugar, 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 all the way. <laughs> so what's happened is man has evolved. Man did not evolve genetically. And I'm saying that we are now evolving hormonally. So we are now hormonally modified humans. Because if you take the genome of this fellow over here, it's not that different from this guy's genome or this guy's genome. And yet, how come they look so different? Because this guy's hormones are completely different from this guy's hormones. And I'm going to show you tonight that our hormones are changing. Our hormones are changing because of our habits. That's your problem. Now, I'm just going to say something. You get one person, and I give him 1,000 calories. He doesn't put on weight. The other guy, I give him 1,000 calories, and all of a sudden, he puts on weight. So the old theory was calories in, calories out. And I'm sure that you all know from my previous talk that that is a whole bunch of baloney. The body will take the 1,000 calories here in that person, and depending on the hormonal status, will burn it off. It'll go to the brown cells, and there's thermogenesis. Brown cells are fat cells that are brown. Their job is to burn energy. So you say, wait a second. You're telling me that the body is just wasting that energy? And the answer is yes. And then this poor fellow over here has no brown cells because he's got a whole bunch of insulin running around in his body. And therefore, he partitions those 1,000 calories straight into storage. And in fact, because he's partitioning it into, into his fat pads, he's hungry. So he's going to come back for another 1,000 from me. He's going to say, give me another 1,000. He's hormonally different. This fellow here is hormonally different. That's his problem. So all this theory that, oh, well, energy is energy, and calories are calories in, calories out, has not worked. Everyone has been saying, eat less, move more, exercise more, burn off calories. And where did it make us go? We became fatter. We became iller. We became more diabetic. We're getting more Alzheimer's, more cancer, more high blood pressure, more dyslipidemia. And that's because our premise was wrong to start off with. If we want to make a dent to health today, we need to change our mind on what's causing us to be sick. It's your hormones. You are hormonally modified homo sapiens. So let's look at our hormones here. You have anabolic hormones, which are your sex hormones and your growth hormones, and the big elephant in the room is insulin. Then you have your catabolic hormones, which are your thyroid, steroids, and glucagon. Now, although I'm going to make a very simple picture of your hormones, it's quite complicated, actually. Because if your insulin levels go up, your growth hormone levels may go down, your sex hormones may go down, your thyroid hormones may go up, 
your steroids may go up and your glucagon may go up. Think about it. And you've seen it. Do you know when I started medical school, I would look at overweight men and women and they, I would say, you know, this person looks like Cushing syndrome, high steroids. So what happened? Well, there's something went wrong here. So when the insulin goes high, this side gets heavy. Well, this side must get heavy, so your steroids go up. And that's how you get that typical Cushingoid appearance of the people. And you wonder why all this is. And then thyroid. Why are our thyroid hormones going crazy? Today, almost a third of people say, I've got a thyroid problem. It's because the body's trying to bring back homeostasis. And you'll find that they, they th so you fix this side, and you will fix this side. And I've done it. We've taken patients and fixed the insulin levels, and guess what? Even the hormones in the thyroid get better. Now, of course, that discussion is beyond the scope of today's talk. But you can understand that there's an intricate connection. When patients get extremely high insulin levels, the sex hormone levels go down. There's an epidemic of this going on. There's advertisements on TV, T levels are low, get your, th your testosterone levels checked. There is hormonal imbalance in men and women left, right, and center today. And I'm gonna to try to convince you today that it's because of that big elephant in the room, insulin. And what modulates your insulin the most is your diet. So my goals today is to, of course, disprove the calorie in, calorie out theory. Antiquated, doesn't work. I'm gonna to prove to you that it's your hormones. I'm gonna to prove to you that what made your hormones go bad was your sugar, your carbohydrates. These are the main drivers of your metabolic status. It's your sugar and your carbohydrates. Not so much of the others, not so much fat, not so much protein. It's the carbohydrates and the sugar. They are the main drivers of your metabolic condition. And it is the high carb, especially the sugar diet. And I'm gonna to prove to you tonight that is sugar that's driving atherosclerosis, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, dementia, and likely cancer as well. One root cause of a multitude of problems. And if you look at those problems, those are all man-made recent problems. These are all m diseases of modern man. What's modern man doing? He is eating sugar and carbs. So when we look at healthy populations around the world in the past, for example, the Inuits or the, or the Maasai in Africa or the people in the, the, the Pacific people, Everybody was healthy when they're eating the ethnic foods. Some are eating a ton of meat only. That's all they eat is meat and milk, and they're healthy. They don't get coronary disease. They don't become obese. Then there are populations that only eat carbohydrates. That's all they eat, and they are perfectly healthy also. And then there are people who only eat fish, and they are perfectly healthy also. But when you look at all these populations, you'll say, ah, you need to be on a Paleolithic diet. And they you say, oh, no, 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 no. Look at those guys there. They eat a lot of carbohydrates. We should be eating all those carbs. So you get terribly confused, and you're getting conflicting data on who should be eating what. But if you look at all these diets, you'll notice one thing. It's what they're not eating. And what they're not eating is refined carbohydrates, and they're not eating sugar. So the common denominator in healthy populations, when you go out and look at them, in all the books that I've read, it's sugar and refined carbs. All of them are not eating refined carbs and sugars, and that's why they're so healthy. So let's move on. Let's look at more data. So this hormonally modified human beings nowadays, look what's happening to them. They have a low HDL, high triglyceride. Their waistline is big. Everything's up here. They have high blood pressure, defined at 130 over, 80, uh, over 85 or more. They have high blood sugar. This is called metabolic syndrome. 
And what's the best way to get to metabolic syndrome real fast? Just eat a lot of sugar. Eat a lot of refined wheat flour. And then on top of it, just add some polyunsaturated fats, which are found in vegetable oils. And now you have the perfect concoction to become a modern man, a hormonally modified man or woman. I'm just using man as a general term. So let's move on. I'm going to show you some more things. So let's see. What's that got to do with coronary artery disease, Dr. J? You're a cardiologist. So I'm going to write, go right into this study, which was 2015. It's a recent study. It's called the Euro Aspire study. And what they did is they said, okay, all these people have had heart attacks. So let's see if they have a problem with glucose metabolism. Because here I am saying that it's all to do with your hormones, and it's mostly got to do with your sugar, and it's your insulin that's out of whack. And that's why you're getting heart attacks. Because after all, that's what I am, a cardiologist. So let's look at the data. One third of the MI patients had diabetes. One third. Two thirds had undiagnosed di diabetes. That means they came in, they didn't know they had diabetes, they worked them up, and they found that, oh my goodness, he's got diabetes. 21% had brand new diabetes, just discovered. 26% had insulin resistance, which means they have prediabetes. And 24% were normal, or what they called normal. But in fact, I put parenthesis, that's my parenthesis, they were pre-diabetic. Because how did they diagnose them as being normal? They checked their sugar levels. And sugar levels don't tell you whether you're pre-diabetic or not. I'm going to prove to you that also tonight. So had they done insulin levels on the 24% that were pre-diabetic, which were normal by glucose standards, I bet you 100% of those patients were diabetics. There is no difference between a pre-diabetic and a diabetic. So don't try to feel good about it. Oh, I just got a touch of diabetes. <laughs> I'm pre-diabetic. I'm not your diabetic. He's diabetic. So what's driving coronary disease? Dr. J says diabetes is a vascular disease. All patients with MI, at least 76% had glucose dysmetabolism, but they were undiagnosed. Diabetes is the main driving force of vascular disease. Vascular disease is caused by glucose metabolism problems. Of the 24 victims that were deemed normal, only glucose was measured. No insulin levels were done, exclamation mark. Why? Because we don't measure insulin levels. Well, this is a major shortcoming, and I'm going to show you the data. Had insulin levels been performed, I guarantee you that every MI victim in that group had an abnormal glucose metabolism, that hyperinsulinemia. So let's look at how accurate the glucose measurements really are. So your glucose measurements are an extremely inaccurate method to know whether your carbohydrate metabolism is on or off. Glucose is terrible. It's like if you want to know if your engine is good, it's like looking at the engine and say, yep, I don't see any grease on it. It looks great. This engine's running fine. That's how bad it is to look at your glucose levels. So let's take a look at it. Let's dive right into it. Defining diabetes with a fasting glucose is very inaccurate. 40% of diabetics had a fasting glucose less than 110 now, where did this data come from? This data came from Dr. Kraft, who unfortunately passed away just a few, a few years ago. Amazing man. He had over 45,000 glucose tolerance tests with insulin levels also. So what he did, he gave you the sugar, then he gave you the, the blood test, and he did your sugar and your insulin levels. And he did correlations between the two to see whether the glucose is accurate or is the insulin accurate? Or what's going on here? He looked at both. Genius. Absolute genius. All his data fell on the wayside because why did it all fall in the wayside? This was in the 60s and 70s. Why? Why didn't this information come out? I'm going to tell you why. It's because we all got onto the fat wagon. When Ansel Keys, my last talk that I gave you all, 
came onto the scene and said, it's all fats, fats, fats cause coronary disease. All the attention went to fat and all the attention went away from sugar. So all this data got shoved under the carpet. Government agencies jumped onto the fat wagon as well. That put the nail on the coffin. That's it. So sugar did not get discussed, and that was a crime. That was a crime against the people. So look at this. 40% of diabetics, according to the test that he did, they're full-blown diabetic. But when you look at their glucose levels, they were less than 110 fasting. 20% had a fasting sugar less than 100. So now be my guest. I want you to all go to your family doctors and just ask for fasting glucose. And 40% of you who are diabetic will come back with a level that's less than 110, pat yourself on the back and say, I don't have any diabetes. Do you see my problem? Do you see the problem I have with this? We need an accurate way of knowing whether you're diabetic or not. And fasting glucose is not the way to diagnose yourself whether you have diabetes or not. So for goodness sake, when you look at your blood labs and say my fasting sugar looks fantastic, it doesn't mean anything. Throw it away. Because you are doing yourself dis a big disjustice. This is terrible. 60% of glucose impaired tolerance testing patients had a fasting sugar of less than 100. So what that means is either you're going to have glucose intolerance or you're going to have diabetes in the majority of patients who actually have the problem, and the fasting glucose is going to give you a false sense of security, and you must avoid fasting sugars. Next. Now, if it is high, it's helpful. But if it's normal, it is not helpful at all. The next test. So you see how antiquated we are. Look, we're practicing medicine of the 1970s when we look at fasting sugars. It's a crime. Fasting insulin levels. Let's look at fasting insulin levels. Only 16% of diabetics had a fasting insulin level that was high, greater than 30. So even a fasting insulin is not a good way of diagnosing yourself with insulin resistance or diabetes. Okay? So your insulin response to the food is more important, not what's happening at, fa at rest. The analogy is your EKG looks great. Oh, yeah, you're fine. You don't have any problem. Is that good enough? No. I go do a stress test. The stress test for your glucose metabolism is to do an insulin glucose tolerance test, where now you drink some sugar water. Now tell me what your insulin level is. So let's move on. My insulin level should be nice and low when I eat, when I take in sugar. That's going to tell me what's happening in my body. Let's move on. So this test that I'm talking about is called a glucose insulin tolerance test. You give the sugar water, you do a fasting insulin level, and in this patient you can see it's 8, and then half an hour later it's 59, 1 hour is 61, 30, 13, 7, and 6. So unfortunately it goes on until 5 hours. And it is a gruesome test to do, but it gives you so much information. And look at the second hour and the third hour, total is 43. Normal is less than 60. Insulin peaks at half an hour. This is a normal insulin response. This is how your insulin should go up and come down in a normal person. This is pattern two, where, look, your insulin fasting levels are still normal at 13, nice and low. But what's happening is that your second and third hour uh, blood insulin is now greater than 60. It's at 126. Now, 44% of people who had a normal glucose tolerance test by sugar had this pattern. So what does that mean? Doctor, I went to my doctor. You are right. He told me that my sh fasting sugar doesn't mean anything, so he did a glucose tolerance test on me. So I drank the sugar water, and he only measured my sugar levels, my glucose levels. And I passed. Aren't I a great kid? And I said to him, you passed your glucose tolerance test? Well, 44% of people with a normal glucose tolerance test actually had hyperinsulinemia. So what? So even a glucose tolerance test is worthless? My answer, yes. Because you may increase your insulin level this much and keep your sugar under control so you pass your glucose tolerance test. Your partner... Massive amounts of insulin keeps his sugar level under control. 
The difference is you both managed to pass your glucose tolerance test, but one had a massive production of insulin, the other one did not. It's your insulin response that's more important because that tells you whether you have insulin resistance. Insulin resistance means that I produce all this insulin, it doesn't do any good to me. My insulin receptors don't respond to insulin. So when I become insulin resistant, instead of needing only two cc's of insulin, I produce a bucket of insulin now. Now my sugars are under control. It's taking a bucket of insulin to produce that same glucose response. And then of course, when you can't produce any more insulin, guess what happens to your sugar level? Now you break through. Are you getting the picture? The sugar level now starts going up when your insulin levels cannot keep up anymore. They are so high. Your poor pancreas is doing overtime and it can't produce any more insulin. That's when your sugar levels will start going up now. You say, well, now I'm a diabetic. Well, sorry, you've been a diabetic for 10 years. How? Because your insulin levels were high. And when your insulin couldn't handle it, that's when now your sugars went up. This 1970s and 1980s technology must stop today because you lost an opportunity of 10 years to 15 years to treat patients who are hyperinsulinemic, but you miss them because their glucose tolerance tests were normal, because their fasting sugars were normal, because their hemoglobin A1Cs were normal. Let's look at pattern number three. In pattern number three, your fasting insulin is still normal, but look how massively increased your insulin levels are. And even at three hours, it's much higher. So you're getting a much longer insulin response. Now I'm gonna explain why all this is important in more detail. But look at this. Those who had a normal glucose tolerance test, 24% had this kind of pattern. So the GTT was normal. They went to the doctor, they got a glucose tolerance test. It was fine but 24% of them had severe hyperinsulinemia. This high insulin level is killing that patient. It's clogging up his arteries, causing him to have blindness, renal failure, dementia, driving cancer, coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, is caused by hyperinsulinemia. 58% of patients who only had a mildly abnormal glucose tolerance test had pattern three, severe hyperinsulinemia. Next, pattern four. Now, in pattern four, your fasting insulins are high. So those of you who go for an advanced lipid panel, blood test, and you're measuring your, your, your fasting insulin, that's the o this is the only time you'll find that the fasting insulins are high. This is the only time. And if you look here, 6% of patients who had a normal glucose tolerance test had this pattern. 16% of diabetics had this pattern. 10% of impaired glucose tolerance tests had this pattern. Now the final pattern is called a pattern five. In pattern five, the insulin levels after you give them sugar water is very low. What's happened in these diabetics is they don't have any insulin. Why? Because their pancreas burnt out. Now, the massive amounts of insulin that were produced over the last 10 to 15 years, which you allowed it to happen, undetected, burnt out your pancreas. Now your insulin levels are low. So your sugars are going to go even higher, and then your doctor's going to put you on which drug? Insulin. So now you end up on insulin because your levels have gone low. So 8% of diabetics actually have this pattern. But I'm going to tell you something, that those patterns that before number five was number four, when the sugars become difficult to control, nobody's measuring insulin levels. So many level four patients who actually have a very high insulin level are getting even more insulin injections, making the problem worse. Do you get it? So I'm a diabetic. My sugars are running really, really high. I'm already on four drugs and my A1C is nine, the doctor will say to me, you know what, doc, you need insulin shots. And you don't question it, and you go ahead and you take insulin shots. But wait a second, my insulin level's already sky high. Did I do myself a service? 
No. And I'll show you data today that those insulin injections will make you gain even more weight, make you even more hungry, and will kill you. So what you need to do, really, at that point, is do one of these tests to say, okay, doc, I've had diabetes for 12 years. Maybe I really, truly need insulin now. You are absolutely right. But measure my insulin level, please. How many of you had this done? One. One, two, three people had the, the insulin level check. This is ridiculous. It should be almost everyone who's a diabetic. Before you add insulin, you better know that your insulin levels are low. If they're not low and they're actually running high, by taking insulin, you're adding fuel to the fire. A lot of data to show this. Lots of data to show this. Yeah. So the glucose in a diabetic patient, the glucose tolerance test, 66% yeah, had pattern 3, 16% had pattern 4, 8% I told you had pattern 5, which is that the, they no longer have insulin. So about almost 10% of diabetic patients are insulin deficient, but they don't know it. So they get even more insulin, which makes things even worse. Now, for patients who have normal glucose tolerance tests, normal GTT, I'm absolutely normal, my GTT is normal, 44% will have pattern 2, 24% will have pattern 3, 6% will have pattern 4, and 4% will have pattern 5. What does that tell you about your glucose tolerance test? It's worthless. It is totally worthless. These, yes, these are all patients with a normal GTT. They go to the doctor, they drink that water, they check their sugars, and they get a pat on the back saying, you great, go home, you're doing great, when all the time they have hyperinsulinemia. And then 10 years later, they're wondering why they ended up with proof of vascular disease, coronary artery disease, hypertension, dyslipidemia, blindness, renal failure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to leave that slide up for just a little bit longer. Normal glucose tolerance test does not predict hyperinsulinemia. Does not. So you can predict who's got hyperinsulinemia without doing a GTT. How do you do that? Look at them. Insulin will make you gain weight right in your belly. So your arms are nice and thin or normal, but all the weight's on your belly you have high insulin level. Number two, they have a low HDL and a high triglyceride. You see that pattern? You know he's hyperinsulinemic. Number three, you'll have high blood pressure. Number four, he'll probably have high uric acid level. Number five, he's probably got some form of vascular disease already. He's either got peripheral vascular disease, coronary artery disease, carotid disease, cerebrovascular disease, but some form of vascular disease already. And those patients will have hyperinsulinemia. You can predict them. You can see them in the office. They're walking around. You see them. Yep, yep, he's got high insulin. He's got high insulin level. So when you have a bad glucose tolerance test, hmm, that's really bad sign those patients will almost all of them have very, very high insulin levels. So yes, a GTT, when it is abnormal, is helpful. But when it's normal, don't think you're out of the woods. Now, what is functional hypogram? I'm throwing this in here because this test that we do, this five-hour insulin test, does help me diagnose functional hypoglycemia, which is actually much more common than we think. What it is is that two hours after taking the sugar water, your sugar levels drop precipitously to less than 50. So typically, they have breakfast, which is such a nice, I'm such a healthy breakfast. You know, I had all bran, and with it, I put some skim milk, and uh, I had a glass of OJ, and I had um, my low-fat yogurt, because low-fat yogurt, so of course high in sugar, yeah, yeah. And, and then two hours later, they're sweating, they're falling asleep, and they faint. Or they're just dysfunctional. They got this mental fog. These patients, what's happened is that because they ate all that high sugary, heart healthy breakfast, now their sugars have dropped 
two hours later because they produce too much insulin. So they get a reaction and the sugar levels fall below 50. So what I do, typically, these people that come into the office, they say, you know, I fainted or I feel terrible. You know, I think there's something wrong with my heart, you know. At 10 in the morning, 11 in the morning, uh, I just can't keep my eyes open. I shake. I think I'm having it. My heartbeat goes really, really fast. Um, I've, you know, I, I have to go and eat something right away. And then I feel so much better. Doc, check me out. That's the typical patient. And then I'll do a five-hour test on them and find that the sugar levels two hours level uh, later are down in the boots. So these patients are overproducing insulin. Those patients are going to become diabetic in five to ten years because they're already starting out producing too much insulin. So a history is very important. So anyone who has syncope, palpitations, lightheadedness, mental fog, behavioral disorder, just can't think after meals, ask questions. Is it two hours after meals? Yes, two hours after a meal, I just have to go eat again. I get, I get voraciously hungry. It's because your sugar levels are probably falling due to hyperinsulinemia. You're on your way to becoming a diabetic. Now, that's different from dumping syndrome. There, your sugar levels fall but usually by one hour, because that, 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 that food goes right through your stomach real fast, usually in bypass patients, um, and so that's a different story. But I threw that in there because symptoms that occur after food are important because you are a hormonally modified human being. Your hormones are mucked up. That's why after food, you feel so sick. So what is this pathology of diabetes? Well, it is atherosclerosis. Patients with high insulin levels, years before the glucose levels start to increase. I already told you that, right? You prepared to become diabetic 10 to 15 years before you became diabetic. You worked hard at it. You did a lot of shopping, a lot of eating, a lot of spending money. You earned your diabetes. It's terrible. Oh, but no. Wait a second. You're told to do this. You're told to increase your carb intake and cut down on fats. Low fat this, low fat that. See how nice it is. Atherosclerosis starts when your insulin levels rise. By the time your glucose is high, it's too late. You already have the disease. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we can't help you and treat you. In fact, we can reverse this disease. So people tell you, yeah, I treat diabetes and I control diabetes. You don't you don't. You can actually reverse it. Yet the American Diabetic Association says that diabetes is a manageable disease. It's not manageable. It's a curable disease. You can restore your sensitivity to insulin. I've done it. Done it. Where your insulin will come back. Your insulin sensitivity will come back. When you're now sensitive to the insulin, your insulin levels should come down. Your A1Cs come down. Your weight comes down. Your stomach goes away. Your blood pressure comes down. You can reverse diabetes. Don't let anyone... Look, did you know that 80% of diabetics who get a gastric bypass, the diabetes is gone. It's cured. This is a curable disease. And I'll show you why your insulin levels are high. So... The pathology is high insulin levels. How do you get your insulin level down? There's no drugs. There's no drug I can give you. Let's give you an IV injection and get your insulin levels down. No, there isn't. But insulin is your killer. Look at this study. They took 208 healthy subjects who were not obese, healthy. They followed them for six years. Healthy people. These are healthy, not overweight people. And what they did is they looked at the insulin status. They're healthy people. But I just told you that healthy doesn't mean anything. It's what your insulin levels going inside. That's how healthy you really are. So they measured the insulin levels, and they said, OK, now let's see who drops like flies. Let's follow them for six years. And look, those who had high insulin resistance, more than 10% of them were dead or diseased by six years. Those who had medium res insulin resistance, 12 out of the 208. So combine 12 plus 28, you got 40. Almost 25% of these people by six years were either dead or diseased based on the insulin status. See, insulin is a very powerful predictor of how well you're going to age. Why is that? 
because you are as old as your arteries. And what's the most important thing that controls the health of your arteries? It's insulin. You are getting the picture now, right? William Osler said, you are as old as your arteries. You want to know how old you are? Just look at your arteries. If they're clogged up, your coronary calcium score is really high, you're old. You're ready to exit this planet. <laughs> Doesn't matter how old you are. You're ready. You're primed up. You're nice and ripe. On the other hand, if your arteries are clean, your calcium score is zero or less than 100, you're almost bulletproof. What will happen? You'll just be walking down the road and you'll die of something else. Get shot by a jealous wife or husband. Who knows? But it's unlikely you'll get a myocardial infarction, stroke, high blood pressure, diabetes-related kidney failure, proof of vascular disease, amputation, blindness, and probably cancer. Wow. Wow. This is powerful. All right. So all cause death rates are also related to your hemoglobin A1C. But why? It's because it's related to your insulin levels, because I just told you that your hemoglobin A1C doesn't really mean that much. A1C does not reflect your insulin levels. A1C just tells you what your sugar levels are doing. And your sugar levels don't mean anything. It's what your insulin levels are doing. But here, even your hemoglobin A1C predicts who's going to get coronary artery disease, cancer, respiratory disease, infectious disease, and strokes. Now, here, I have to stop right there and tell you all. So my A1C came down by 0.1 by using these two drugs. Yeah, so what? It didn't impact your survival. If it did, this much. But if I brought your hemoglobin A1C down to 5.5 through my program, which is going to be complete abstinence from sugar, carbohydrates, and intermittent fasting, and bringing everything down and supplementing you and doing all the right things to you, I'll have a profound impact on you without any drugs or side effects of the drugs. Bring your A1C down to less than 5.5. Now, that is medicine. And by the way, that's not curing the patient. What that is is bringing the patient back to his normal way. That is fixing his insulin resistance. That is hormonally going back to the way you're supposed to be. And you know what? When you hormonally go back to normal, the body has the infinite intelligence to give you the health that, and, and body that you really deserve to have genetically. But we muck it up through mucking up the hormones. Fix this, and your body will get back to the way it was supposed to be and designed and runs the way it's supposed to run. So how does this insulin and glucose dysmetabolism cause this disease process? How does it do it? We've known since the 70s that insulin causes endothelial dysfunction. That means the blood vessels can't vasodilate and constrict. Insulin directly reduces your nitric oxide levels. It causes atherosclerosis of the artery, microangiopathy in the retina, the glomerulus, you go blind. In the glomerulus, you go, your kidneys go to peace. You get coronary artery disease, microvascular disease inside the heart, CNS. CNS. Let me tell you about the CNS. Yeah, yeah I'm worried about Alzheimer's. You should be more worried about microvascular disease in your brain. And after all the research that I do, I've come to the conclusion that at least 70% of all the dementia that I see as a cardiologist in my office is vascular disease. It's microangiopathy in the brain. And you look at the CT scans, it's a small vessel disease. What does that mean, small vessel disease? I wasn't born with small vessels in my brain. Small vessel disease is diffuse atherosclerosis in the brain. And it's all caused by the same thing. The same thing that gives you a heart attack gives you peripheral vascular disease. That same thing gives you carotid disease. That same thing gives you a stroke. That same thing causes you to have dementia, too. They're all one and the same thing. And I take it a, a step further that there's so much data now linking insulin and sugar to cancer. That cancer cells behave totally differently when they're in a situation of high insulin and high glucose. There's a direct correlation between 
insulin sugar met metabolism problems, breast cancer, and colon cancer. This is unequivocal. This is not, no, oh yeah, he's just conjecturing. There's data on this. Now, I can't show you all this stuff, can I? But I read on your behalf, and one day I might show you those slides too. So Dr. Stout was a professor. He was in Dublin. He had all this data in the 70s. It all got eclipsed. Why? Because we all jumped onto the high-fat bandwagon, saying that it's fats that causes atherosclerosis, not sugar. To the extent that in 1977, the McGovern Report came out. The McGovern Report was written by one man who happened to be a vegan, and he also said, oh, yeah, yeah, we mustn't eat meat, and we mustn't eat red meat. He had no data. The scientists all got up and said that, hey, this is wrong. We shouldn't be telling the American people to cut down fat when there's no evidence that it is saturated fats that cause coronary artery disease. But because of people like Ansel Keys and everybody else, oh, wh wh why, why, why were we so high on fats? Well, look, people were dying. We got to do something. If all of you have a complaint, and I'm the physician here, and I have a policy that I can rubber stamp, upon, I'm going to do something about it. So based on extremely flimsy data, they came out with the food pyramid, which basically vilified fats, and all the attention went on to fats. And of course, then it spawned a whole industry to produce low-fat diets. And by the way, you all carried out all the recommendations, you're such good people. You did. 35% reduction in red meat consumption. On average, 30% reduction in the amount of fats that you took in from saturated fats. All of you did it. And you have to replace that with something. And you increased your intake of carbs. So you all went on a high-carb diet, eating all that bread and wheat products. Crackers, potatoes, starchy vegetables, yams and beans and all these things. And your carb intake just shut off. Now, that's okay. Look, I don't have a problem with glucose. And starch is glucose molecules stuck together. My problem is with fructose and sugar. So I'm going to come to that in a second. But what that did, it spawned obesity. So let me clarify something with all of you right now. The problem is with fructose, not so much with glucose. Starch is 100, 200 glucose molecules stuck together. That's starch. So you eat a potato, you're just going to get a lot of uh, glucose into your body, not sugar. It's potato. It's a natural thing. It's got glucose. Glucose will be handled by your body. But if you take too much of it, you will put on weight. But that fat will be healthy fat. It will not be this. And I'm going to show you today that the fats that goes here is generated by fructose. So people around the world who are on a high-carbohydrate diet, they didn't get the disease. So I don't mind that all of you went and started eating more carbs. It's the sugar that got you, because there's a combination of sugar and starch that made you overweight. Now, when you get sufficiently overweight, you will become insulin resistant also. But did you know, if you look at all obese people, only about 30% have bad fat. So the others have healthy fat. They're not sick. They don't have metabolic syndrome. They don't have a low HDL and a, and, and a high triglyceride. They're just overweight, but they're otherwise healthy. Those people are consuming too much carbohydrate. So I do put them on a low-carb diet, but for a different reason. I just want them to lose weight because I don't want them to become insulin resistant in the future. And I don't want them to get joint disease. And I don't want them to get high blood pressure. But that's different from the guys who have got this. And I do a biopsy of that. It's full of macrophages. Lots and lots of macrophages. Inflammatory cells. Look, fat should be fat. But the fat that is in the viscera in patients who, have, who are on a high sugar diet, that fat is full of inflammatory cells. And it produces tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-6, I mean, name it. And these things drive the atherosclerotic process. They have inflammation in their body. Fat itself is not inflammatory, but bad fat is. So I'm going to come to that in a second here. So 
He said that it's the insulin and dysmetabolic condition that causes, caused by insulin that causes disease, vascular disease. I told you endothelial dysfunction. Smooth muscle proliferation. That's when the arteries get hardening. They, they, the smooth muscle proliferates, so the muscle becomes harder, thicker. Lipid deposition. The bad fat, once it's overspilled from the liver, goes to your arteries and now deposits itself in the artery. The bad fats go to your liver, from your liver, go to the liver first, then it goes to the pancreas, then it goes to your muscles, and then gets into the arteries. Then patients with high insulin levels, remember that seesaw I showed you? The growth hormone levels are low. Therefore, there's lack of repair. And they get increased catabolism, which means that the walls of the blood vessels break down. Why? Because they have increased steroids as well. So this whole cascade then causes hardening of the arteries. So diabetes increases cardiovascular risk by 500%, but it appears that it's the insulin level. This is the hidden parameter. It's insulin. Which is why, look, I mean, you go to your doctor and you get your sugars treated. My glucose level is now much better. You still get a heart attack. My sugar levels are better. You still get dementia. You still get a stroke. What do diabetics die of? Heart disease. But you're on four medicines. Well, that's a lot of fat good it did you taking four medicines for diabetes, but your insulin levels are still high. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, We'll come to the medicines in a minute because there are some diabetes medicines that are better than others. But basically, all of them only scratch the surface. If you really want to get a handle on your insulin, it's your diet. It is your diet. And until we face and you're going to get such a bang for the buck just with simply cutting out the sugar and watching your diet. Cut out the fructose. I'm going to show you that in a second. So how did insulin levels get so high in the first place? So my insulin levels, I go to the doctor, my God, they're really high, but I thought I was a good boy. Well, because you developed insulin resistance. So why did you get insulin resistance? Because you're eating too frequently. Oh, because you got to eat five times a day, you know. Keep that, keep that energy level good. Isn't that the advice you were given? Disgusting. Disgusting advice given by authorities. I want you to all know that you got to take your health into your own hands and stop listening and start thinking. So we are all taught, oh, you got to have three meals. Look, listen, I like dietitians, but I totally disagree with everything they say. <laughs> Is it three meals a day, two snacks in between, maybe a late night snack? I said, what the hell are you doing? So what happens is your insulin levels go up, and before they get a chance to come down, they're up again. And before they get a chance to come down, they're up again. So all day long, your insulin levels are high, even right before you go to bed. So now your poor insulin receptors are being bombarded by insulin all the time. So what happens when a receptor gets bombarded all the time? It downregulates. It doesn't respond to it anymore. It's pushed all that glucose into the cells also. There's no more room now. Those carriages are full. You can't push any more glucose into the cells. The poor insulin can't do its job. So it says, well, you know what? We had two cops pushing all these people into this wagon. Well, just order another 12 cops to come along. Now 12 cops line up, and they're all pushing everyone into the What is this? That's insulin resistance. So what causes insulin resistance is insulin. What made too much insulin? You stimulated it too much too frequently, and now you became insensitive to it. And what made your sugar levels go up so much is, one, eating too frequently. Stop eating so frequently. You're a paleolithic human being, actually, and your genetics are more than 10,000 years old. So in those days, you were not such a good archer that you could make a hunt and kill it every two hours. <laughs> you probably made a kill, and then you probably didn't eat for another day or two. That's all you did. You're supposed to feast and fast, but we don't do that anymore. And we have a phenomenal physiology in us for feasting and fasting and repairing. And we don't utilize that all the time, so we feast, 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 feast all the time, and therefore you became hormonally modified human beings. Also, your sugar intake was massive. 
Now, some chemistry. Sugar is 50% glucose and 50% fructose. Everyone knew that, right? So sugar is not glucose. Sugar is 50% glucose, 50% fructose. So the body breaks it down. Glucose, I told you, not too bad. Your body knows how to handle it. And glucose is utilized by every cell in the body. So you eat some glucose. Let's say you ate a potato. It's going to be metabolized everywhere. A little bit will come to your liver, and you'll produce a little bit of fat from it, but most of your glucose got absorbed in your body. Fructose, on the other hand, cannot be utilized by any cell in your body except the liver. Did you know that? Did you know that liver is the only organ that can metabolize fructose? Your body cannot get any energy out of fructose. The only way you can get energy out of the fructose is have your liver converted to fat. What? You mean sugar becomes fat? How many of you knew that sugar, eating a teaspoon of sugar or Coke, a can of Coke, or soft drink, I should say, that a can of soft drink will become fat in your body? Did any of you know that? It's amazing that sugar becomes fat in your body, and then the fat can be utilized. But this graphic is missed by parents, school teachers, administrators, politicians, policymakers, industry. Industry loves it. I'll come to industry in a second, because they are just as much. All these culprits, all of them are culprits, played the greatest experiment of health in history on the planet Earth. They are responsible for millions of unnecessary morbidities and mortalities. So the fructose, and by the way, high fructose corn syrup, oh, that's such a bad thing, is 55 to 60% fructose. But did you know that it's 40 to 45% glucose? So what is the difference between sugar and high fructose corn syrup? Not much. High fructose corn syrup is 55% fructose. Sugar is 50%. So you're getting 5% more fructose. But I want you to know what the politics behind this is. So the Europeans, you know, much smarter than us Americans, right? So what did they do? Oh, we're going to ban high fructose corn syrup. It's so bad for you. And they banned it. And all of us said, oh, look, they're so smart they did it. But now they are all consuming sugar, thinking that they just did themselves a great favor not realizing that fructose is, sugar is just as bad as fructose. If you want to ban anything, you should ban both of them. But you see, it makes you feel like the government did something for you. That they banned high fructose corn syrup, my government's looking out for me. I'm saying no. That's just a game to show you that they're doing something for you. If you want to ban anything, you should ban sugar and high fructose corn syrup, both. Because there's not much difference between them. And the manufacturer of high fructose corn syrup are absolutely right. There's no difference between sugar and high fructose corn syrup. But yet they lead you all to think that, oh, high fructose corn syrup is a real bad thing. I'm just going to have natural sugar. I'm going to have natural sugar. Now, how many times have I heard that uh, natural sugar is fine? I even have brown sugar, by the way. You know, it's just white sugar, but it's got a little, it's brown. Well, who cares if whether it's brown or not? It's still sugar. But what they've done is they take some demerara stuff, that brown stuff, and they, they color it at the end. Did you know that? It's white, and they just color it at the end. But then and now you think that, oh, man, uh, I don't, you know, I ban high fructose corn syrup. I don't buy any ketchup with high fructose corn syrup. I just, you know, and, you know, for my tea, I just use brown sugar now. But, but what created this? What created this where you feel that one is better than the other, get rid of one? It's ignorance, because we don't realize they're both poisons. Now, which one do you want to die from? Just choose your poison. Do you want to die from sugar or high fructose corn syrup? You're still going to die. Friends, there's no difference between sugar and high fructose corn syrup. They're both deadly. One's got 5% more than the other. So please, we need to broaden our net 
not just aim it at one thing and think that, oh, because I no longer consume high fructose corn syrup, I'm, I'm, I'm out of danger. No, you're still in danger because you're consuming sugars. So how did the insulin levels get so high? Because we consumed a ton of sugar over time. Look at this. 57 grams to 85 to 97 now, over 120 grams of sugar, especially the youngsters. Oh, my God. The adolescents? Oh, my God. And they think they're invincible. They just consume sugar left, right, and center. And then, of course, our beautiful food, food pyramid, which misled everybody. And here we are now. We're in a fine mess. So let's look at the coronary mortality with total fat intake from the various countries. And the fat intake, you can see there's no real correlation. But look at the sugar. Direct correlation, significant. The p-value is very significant for pure sugar, sugar intake. Now, this is very important, OK? This is regulation of hepatic, that means your liver, de novo lipogenesis. De novo means new fat production. Lipogenesis means making fat in human beings. That's us. So what happens in these studies, and the next one, which is the dietary sugar production of hyperglycidemia. So what? You mean to say the sugars are making fats in us? Yes. These studies demonstrate that excess carbs directly feed into new fat formation by the liver. Very well established. So go and eat some sugar. Go and eat some fructose. And your liver will promptly convert that into bad fat. And this bad fat will be first deposited in the liver, then it'll be exported to your body. And I tell you, this bad fat is inflammatory. This is a totally different kind of fat. The fat that your liver makes is not your friend. The fat that you ate went into your intestines. The chylomicrons formed. They got absorbed, and they were dealt with properly and distributed throughout the whole body. This stuff that comes out of the liver is lethal. So the liver is an organ that detoxifies everything. So you, when you eat toxic stuff like fructose and sugar, the liver takes it and wants to export it away. It wants it out of the liver. Unfortunately, we don't have a better thing to do with the fructose except to convert it into fat. And I'm going to show you that this fat is really bad. Fructose drives postprandial triglycerides. So this is a beautiful experiment. What they did is, you know when we draw blood in the lab and you, you look at it and say, oh my God, the blood settled down and look at this top portion, it's so murky. This guy is eating fat all day long. Well, guess what? It didn't come from fat. So if I give you a high fat diet and I give you a lot of sugar, especially that healthy breakfast that I just mentioned, and then two hours later I draw your blood, yours will be milky because it's full of triglycerides. But even as a medical student, I thought that that fat came from somebody who's pigging out on eggs. But eggs don't do it. Huh, what? Yeah, this one guy, physician, a little crazy. I should go meet him. <laughs> he, he ate 59, I don't know why not 60, 59 eggs every day for one month. Now, when he let out air, I, no, no, never mind. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in the same room. But, <laughs> but he ate 59 eggs every day, and then he measured his cholesterol levels. It dropped. HDL went up. Triglycerides went down. Just as a point. So it's, you know, you think that those triglycerides that come up at the top, you no, know, it's from sugar. It's from sugar that's coming from your liver. It's that the liver's just produced it, and now it's circulating in your body. So let's look at these drawings here. So we go, here we go. So let's look at your triglyceride levels. When you have sugar, it goes up. Fructose goes up. High fructose corn syrup goes up. Let's look at your change in your triglycerides. Highest with fructose and high fructose corn syrup. And look at this. This is your your change in your fasting triglyceride levels. Glucose makes your triglycerides go up. Fructose makes it go up. High fructose corn syrup makes it go up. So the triglycerides, that's the fat in your blood, is produced by sugar. 
Now, how many of you have been told that, oh, yeah, yeah, you've got high triglycerides, you need to cut out your fat? And they do, because you all are really good people. And then you go back for blood tests and triglycerides are still high. Happens all the time. Look, I've been doing this for 30 years. Why do you think I'm so upset? Because people came to me saying their cars don't work properly, their engine is rattling when they turn it on and crank it five times and then only goes and can't go more than 30 miles per hour. And I, what do I do? I check the tire pressure and say, you're just fine. <laughs> That's what we've done. We've checked the tire pressure in people with engine problems. We've missed the boat on everything. So these triglycerides, when I tell them, go home, cut out all your sugars, and the triglycerides just drop like crazy. Cut out the carbs. Could lose some weight by cutting out carbs. The triglycerides fall. And that HDL, oh, no, you can't change that HDL. You know, there's no drugs. Even if there is a drug, it only increases it by 4 or 5%. You know, HDL is so stubborn. All your physicians in the crowd should know that, right? It's so hard to do. There is one way to treat it. Cut out all the sugar, lose weight. Do intermittent fasting, your HDL will go up 10 points. 10 points, guaranteed. So, the low-carb diet versus the low-fat diet. Let's look at metabolic syndrome. I told you what it is, right? Sugar, insulin, blood pressure, triglycerides, and the HDL. So let's look at it. Low-carb diet is blue. Low-fat diet is in purple. Blue, glucose. What happens to your glucose on a low-carb diet? Goes down. What happened to your insulin levels? Massive re reduction. What happens to, on a low-carb diet to your blood pressure? drops. Low carb diets lower blood pressure. Low fat diets do not reduce blood pressure. Triglycerides, massive reduction. On a low fat diet, there'll be some reduction because remember, fats don't come isolated. They come with some other, uh, other things too. So when you go on a low fat diet, there's also some reduction in your carb intake because nothing comes in its perfect isolation, right? Food is mixed. And look what happened to the HDL. Massive increase with the low-carb diet. And you know that HDL and triglyceride ratio is the most important marker for coronary artery disease. You want to know right now whether you're going to be a heart patient or not, look at your triglycerides and your HDL. Your ratio, triglyceride at the top, HDL at the bottom. It should be two or less. So if your triglyceride is 100, your HDL should be 50. Got it? This is a number you have to remember. And those who don't know it, go and educate your doctors. That's the number you should be looking at. So when I look at lipid panels on my patients, I'm looking at lipid panels for a different reason. Wow, time's already up. So I'm looking at it not for cholesterol. I'm looking at the lipid abnormalities because of carbohydrate dismetabolism. So it's your lipids. So what has happened over the years? We've said, your cholesterol's your problem. Triglycerides, HDL, all this, you've got a lipid problem. No, you don't have a lipid problem. You've got a carbohydrate problem, which is reflected in your lipid panel. Do you get it? You have a carbohydrate problem displayed in your lipid panel. That's where it's showing up. So this is what happens. Fructose goes to pyruvate, increases uric acid, which causes hypertension. JNK1 goes up. That causes insulin resistance in the liver. And pyruvate goes to acetate, then high amounts of citrate in your mitochondria. VLDL, the bad fat. So fructose goes straight down here to the bad fat. The bad fat goes to your belly and gives you a belly, goes to fatty liver, you get a fatty liver, and then goes to insulin resistance because now your liver cannot respond to insulin anymore. The VLDL gets translated to triglycerides and drops your HDL because HDL gets consumed and your triglycerides go high. Your JNK1 that goes up causes insulin resistance. How? Through your muscles because these free fatty acids from here go to your muscles and make your muscles insulin resistant as well. Very complicated, very complicated. But in a nutshell, it all starts with fructose. This is the best way to get to this is through fructose.
So fructose is not glucose. Fructose is seven times more likely than glucose to also cause advanced glycation end products. What that really means is that in its metabolism, it generates a lot of reactive oxygen species compared to glucose. In glucose, you know, every, anything that combustion occurs, you're going to get free radical generation, right? Oxygen free radicals. But the number of oxygen free radicals generated when glucose is metabolized, much less than fructose. So fructose causes reactive oxygen species. And reactive oxygen species, if your own body's endogenous antioxidants are not high enough, you're going to get damage to your mitochondria, damage to your DNA, you get advanced aging. So you want to grow fast? A lot of fructose. And you'll get old real quick. That's what causes degeneration. So fructose does not suppress ghrelin. So when you consume foods that are high in sugar, your fructose portion doesn't even register in your brain. That's why you're hungry still. That's why kids are hungry still. When they eat sugary things, do they ever come and say, oh, I'm so full now? No. But you give them something fatty, they'll be full. They won't eat anymore. In fact, force them. Take a stick of butter next to them and say, shove it down your stomach. <laughs> they can't. They'll eat some butter, but then they're full. But I think that's a great experiment. And then say, but sugar? They've just finished eating, they're gonna go eat more and more and more and more. Because sugar doesn't satisfy you, there's no satiation. And fructose bypasses all of that. So you eat fructose, you're still hungry. So there's no balance, there's no checks and balance. You eat fats, you eat proteins, you're gonna produce cholecystokinin, you're gonna produce leptin. None, nothing will happen with, 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 with sugar. You'll just keep eating and eating and eating. And hepatic fructose, I told you, is metabolized differently, and chronic fructose exposure will promote the metabolic syndrome. This is a slide from Dr. Robert Lustig. See that, this name at the bottom here, this fellow here? Amazing. You all should look at his YouTubes. They are amazing. If you want to get into details, I've borrowed these slides from him, actually. So we show here that non-enzymatic glycation, much higher with fructose than glucose. So much more damage done to the body with fructose than glucose. So how many fruits do I eat a day? One, maybe. But I eat berries every day, blueberries, because they have coloring in them. The darker the fruit, the better. So I love blueberries because they give me the fruits that I need, my antioxidants that I need, my anti-cancer medication, all that is built into my blueberries. But you won't see me just chomping down an apple, then an orange, and then a banana, and then a bunch of grapes, and sit there doing my homework with grapes over there. Now, you won't see me doing that. Because look, fruits are supposed to be at the fall of the year. For what? They all grow in the fall. Why? Because they're supposed to fatten you up for what? For winter. But no winter never comes. <laughs> so we have a fall throughout the year. Fruits are overrated. And when I said that to my dietitian, she almost had a seizure. Because <laughs> she was promoting five fruits a day. I said, you crazy? How can you eat five fruits a day? Unless you want to get fat. Unless you want to become hormonally modified. Yeah, be my guest. So this was a fantastic study also done by Robert Lustig, and this was done in kids. Well, and I'm going to have to run real fast because I think we only have another 10 minutes max. But the bottom line in this is they took kids, and they gave them the same number of calories, but they took out the fructose and just gave them instead glucose. So the total calories were the same, but only fructose they took out from their diet. And look what happened. The glucose tolerance test got better and the insulin levels dropped. The insulin resistance went away. So remember I was telling you earlier on that glucose is not so much of an enemy, except if you're overweight. But if you're looking at your hormone and your metabolism and everything else, it's the fructose that's worse. These kids, the two groups, had the same number of calories. They replaced the fructose with glucose, and look what happened. The insulin levels came down, the glucose tolerance test got better. Who's the culprit? It's the fructose. You want your kids to be healthier? Cut out the juices. Juice is not a healthy food. Fruit juices are poisons. 
especially for kids. Diet induced obesity in mice. Oh, this was a great study. So let me tell you, this, this is fantastic. What they did here is they took mice, okay, and they gave them standard chow, and they looked at their weights, and then they gave them a Western diet, and of course they went really quite fat, and then they gave them a high, really lot of fats in their diet, lots of it, both carbs and everything else, and they got really bad. So this is not just high fat, it's high fat plus high carbs, just a lot of calories. Then what they did is they took the standard chow, and they pulverized it. In fact, they took all three and they pulverized it into a fine powder. And now they fed it to the rats, and all of them got fat, no matter what they ate. What's the lesson? Wait, there's something we do, some, something very similar to this, don't we? It's called flour. It's called bread. So when you eat bread, you pulverize the flour, which is absolutely worthless now. There's a direct correlation from the year 1880 onward when the incidence of all these diseases I talked about started going up. Why in the year 1880? It's because when the steel mill was invented. The steel mill and the milling process of wheat came about. So what happens is now, the glycemic index and the characteristics of our flour is totally different from the flour that bread was made from that Jesus broke over his knees. It was that heavy when he broke bread. So our problem is that we've changed our food and making it into fine powders, refining it because we are modern man is terrible. You want to eat bread, then you make it out of absolute whole stuff. It's going to be heavy. It's going to be hard to cut. Um, and you can maybe eat a slice of it. That's the bread you should be eating. Anything you have, Look, avoid flour. I'm just telling you all, avoid flour. So avoid sugar, avoid fructose, avoid flour. And the last thing, of course, is vegetable oils, which I touched upon in my last lecture. So don't eat vegetable oils. If you just did these, these things, you will be extremely healthy. Avoid sugar, avoid fructose. Avoid fine flour, and avoid vegetable seed oils. Vegetable seed oils made from seeds. That doesn't mean coconut oil. That doesn't mean olive oil, because that's made from the pulp. That doesn't mean butter. It means sunflower seed oil, soy oil, canola oil, all the oils that are manufactured. Those are the ones you must completely avoid. So here, postprandial sugar again. This is insulin and GIP response to refined bread. Look what refined bread does. Shoots up your plasma GIP levels and shoots up your insulin levels. Look at that versus more whole grain stuff, whole grain pasta. It has to be whole grain. It won't taste that good, it'll be heavy, it's hard to cook, but everything has to be whole grain. It has to be the way nature gave it to you. Otherwise, don't eat it. The more refined it is, poison. I just showed you the slides. Unless you want to spike in your insulin and your GIP. So excess exposure to insulin is the primary cause of insulin resistance. Too much insulin causes insulin resistance. To bring it down, you've got to change your diet. Stop stimulating insulin in your body. And fat cell dysmetabolism also causes insulin resistance. Okay, fine. The liver is the main source of the insulin resistance, mainly caused by fructose, which is found in sugar, of course. So how do you correct this hyperinsulinemia? You must create low levels of insulin. How do you create low levels of insulin? Without drugs... Without drugs, you do it through diet and fasting. Now, what do I mean by fasting? I'm going to give my next lecture on fasting and survival. But basically, look, if you're not hungry, don't eat. That's the first thing. Rule number one. Just because it's time to eat, what you mean, this clock is the, the main reason why I eat? Hey, I mean, you got to eat when you're hungry. you got to get out of this mode that I have to eat three times a day with five uh, snacks. Number two. Try to only eat once a day. Try it. Try it. So the way I tell my patients, look, I'm going to give you a summary of how I tell my patients to do it. Number one, for two weeks, you cut out all these unnecessary carbs and sugars for two weeks so you get used to being on a low-carb diet and you're not going to get uh, the addiction that you have to sugar. And, you know, because sugar is addictive. 
So when you stop eating sugar, your dopamine levels are going to go crazy. The same place, like morphine, it goes to the same place sugar goes, and you're going to go through withdrawal. There is no doubt you will go through withdrawal. But you got to hang it out. So for two weeks, you cut out all the sugars. So at the end of two weeks, all your cravings will be gone. And you're just like a junkie that you take him away from his drugs or alcohol. After a week, he won't crave it anymore. So he won't crave the sugar. So do that for, for two weeks first. Then after two weeks, randomly skip a meal here and there. Today, I'm not hungry. Skip breakfast. Tomorrow, I'll skip lunch. Friday evening, I was really busy, something, skip the dinner. Now, have the meal that is socially best for you because you don't want to get kicked out of the house either. So, but learn to skip meals. You'll realize, my goodness, I didn't die. And when hunger does come, it'll come, it'll be gone. Hunger never stays all afternoon. Let's say you missed lunch and I got hungry at 2 o'clock. I'll drink a glass of water. Or I'll have a black coffee, and half an hour later, my hunger's gone. Because ghrelin, which is what causes hunger, is released by my stomach. It comes in pulsatile modes of half an hour. So it comes four times a day through memory. It knows that I've eaten four times in the past. So every, all, when those hours come, it, there's a pulsatile increase in ghrelin levels. But over time, the ghrelin kind of stabilizes itself. It goes lower and lower and lower and lower. So ghrelin only lasts for half an hour. Then hunger is gone. And then you'll find the rest of the... Oh my God, my hunger went away. Try it. You have to try it. You, know, you won't die. Promise you, you won't. So, so cutting out meals here and there. Do that for two weeks. So now a month has gone by. You still survived. Then you get up one morning and you'll say, this week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm just going to eat one meal a day. I'm going to wake up and, oh, just one day a week. Try it for one day a week for another two weeks. Then go to two days a week. And then go to three days a week, and you can stop there. Because by then, most of you already start noticing how good you feel, how your sugar levels are better, maybe you lost weight, because your insulin levels will come down. When your insulin levels come down, where's the first place you're going to lose weight? In your belly. Your belly will go down. And because you're doing it not through caloric restriction, you're really doing it through fasting, your hormones are totally different. So let me explain something. If you just cut down on calories, but you're eating three times a day, your hormones are very much the same as they were before. Do you get it? So yes, you took in less calories, and maybe you lose some weight, but you're going to feel terrible, you're going to lose muscle mass, and you'll just, you will gain back all that weight again in about a month or two. But when you do it to fasting, you're changing your hormones. That's my next talk. That's what I'll talk to you about next time when you come. Your growth hormone levels, your epi levels, your steroid levels, everything is going to change. you got to do intermittent fasting. Now when you lose weight... It's in a different hormonal condition. You will not lose so much muscle mass. You will have brain-derived neurotropic factor. You'll be smarter, better, brighter. You'll feel better. And you'll lose fat in the right places. And you'll remodel your body. You'll have autophagy. So when you lose the fat, your arms won't hang like this because of the skin. You'll lose the skin together with the fat. You will remodel completely. Different type of weight loss program. Not this cut down on calories, just eat, starve yourself. You'll be thinking of food all day long. You try what I'm doing, you won't think of food. You'll think you'll, but you won't. So diabetes. By doing everything that I'm saying, you can definitely reduce your risk of diabetes. Metformin can also help you, but these are drugs. and. Um, this is the, what I was saying earlier on. In the interest of time, I'm going to fly through this because it's intermittent versus continued energy re restriction. In the long term, caloric restriction does not work. That's what the slide is all about and tells you that fasting, intermittent fasting, gives you a better sustained weight loss over time. See? Intermittent fasting, reduced insulin levels more. You want to drop your insulin levels? Fasting will do it. Caloric restriction, you'll get a mild reduction. Look at this at six months. Look at your insulin level, 6.2. I mean, 6.3. 6 
and type 0.2. See that? So it's the insulin levels that drop fastest with fasting than with caloric restriction. Reduce your cholesterol also through a diet that's high in animal fat. Oh my God, this is a beautiful study. What it shows is that the HDL went up. Your cholesterol fell. Triglycerides went down in animal fat, cutting out carbs. Low carb diet and coronary heart disease. In conclusion, diets that were low in carbohydrates but were higher in protein and fat were not associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular diseases in women, and therefore these diets cause a lower risk for coronary heart disease. This has been shown over and over again. It's the low carb diet. That's the diet that reduces heart disease. Here's another one, where what it shows here is that you, the higher your glucose levels, the more your carotid gets clotted. The more your carotid thickness increases. High carb diets, triglyceride rich lipoproteins and coronary heart disease, again, Phenomenal study, I'll go through another day with you, but this is the bottom line. This is a quote from the authors themselves. Given the atherogenic potential of these changes in lipoprotein metabolism, it seems appropriate to question the wisdom of recommending that all Americans should replace the dietary saturated fats with carbohydrates. We've been questioning this for a long time. It's hard to get people to change their minds because they, they in, you know, when I talk to patients about this, they look at me sometimes, they're like, what? And even the doctors themselves look at me like, whoa, 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 stop, what are you doing? Uh, I'm going to go on to another one here. Oh, th that, that study just shows that heart attack patients, all, almost all of them have abnormal glucose metabolism. Oh, this was phenomenal. 33% reduction in your triglycerides, HDL, massive increase of 11%. The VLDL, the bad one, goes down by 30%. Insulin level dropped by 34%. In who? In a ketogenic diet. Now, I'm not advocating that you all go on a ketogenic diet, because in this diet, 80% of the fat is from fat and 20% from proteins and, uh, and carbs. And that's an extremely carb-restricted diet, and it's very hard to do. But these are studies that were done on people who had, like, seizures, and they said, my God, yes, the seizures are better, but look at the blood. And they get very low incidence of heart disease. Now, I'm not saying we should go on a ketogenic diet at this point, but I'm saying cut down on your carbs. And um, six months, low-carb diet, okay, Look at what happens. Decrease in your cholesterol, LDL goes uh, down, triglycerides, 56 points. HDL went up by 10 points. All this is how you can improve your insulin resistance. All these things. Peripheral vascular disease. In peripheral vascular disease, cholesterol was not found to be a marker, but insulin definitely was a problem. Now, this is my last slide, so you all will be happy to hear that. This is just to show you that as a government agency, if we ban sugar, it'll work. Watch. This is the consumption. The blue is the consumption of sugar. 1915 went up, and then what happened? Yeah, the war. Sugar consumption went down. Then it went up again, the blue, the sugar. And then the next war came, went down. And then look at the red. Huh? What happened? What happened to mortality? Oh, it's the other way around. Sorry, diabetes mortality, and this one is the sugar consumption. Exactly on top of each other. So mortality, diabetic mortality, which is basically cardiovascular disease, mapped exactly the sugar intake. Not the fat intake. Sugar intake. Sugar intake, because during the war there was no sugar. It was rations. That's my next talk. It's going to be on this. So I hope this has thrown some light that we've been, you know, checking the wrong tire pressures <laughs> instead of checking the engine. We've been putting the wrong fuel in the fuel tank.
Instead of putting the right fuel, we're putting the wrong fuel in there. So we've become hormonally modified. We can regain our hormonal status. And it's not just insulin. I'm telling you, I can talk for another two hours about your testosterone levels. I can talk about menopause. I can talk to you about, about PCOS. I can talk to you about adult growth hormone deficiency. All these things, and they're all related one way or the other to everything that I've said over here. So I thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.